You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Before we get underway, be sure to subscribe to our show on iTunes and look for us on Twitter with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to return to conversations we recorded at Optic 2017 Conference for a chat we had with fine art photographer and publisher of Lenswork Magazine, Brooks Jensen. We speak with Brooks about the artistic process as it applies to photography and specifically about his feelings that structure and even in limitations are the breeding ground of art. With parameters in place, we can find it easier to avoid distraction and create the art we want to. We also talk with Brooks about digital versus analog image preservation, the purpose of art, and even a bit about Billie Holiday. After a break, we're going to return with episode four of our ongoing series, Dispatch, with Adrian O'Hanneson. Okay, before we go any further, it is Al's Gearhead Pick of the Week. And this time around, we're going to be talking about the Loop Deck Photo Editing Console. The Loop Deck is designed to improve the fluidity of your workflow when editing photos in Adobe Photoshop Lightroom 6 or Creative Cloud. The Loop Deck replaces your keyboard and mouse with a flat console with rows of dedicated dials, wheels, and keys for adjusting exposure, image clarity, image ratings, contrast, tint, etc., you can also program preset buttons for quicker editing. The Loop Deck connects to computers via standard USB 2.0 interface, and it costs a mere $299 on the B&H website. And for the record, John Harris actually used one the other day and says that it's pretty darn good. So I'll take that as a good affirmation of the product. Okay, all this business taken care of. Here we go with Brooks Jensen. Baby shoes? Baby for shoes. sale, yeah, right. <laughs> never worn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Six words. I, you know, I'm a big believer in, when it comes to art making in structure. At least I've discovered that from my own artwork. Uh, if you try to just engage a project without having any kind of guide rails or boundaries or whatever, and you can do anything, the problem is you have a hard time deciding what to do. Mm -hmm. So one of the strategies, if I can use that word, for developing... Uh, art projects has been to think about a structure first. And one of the best structures I've come across for years and years and years now is this idea of uh, seeing in sixes, which is a total ripoff, I have to admit, mm -hmm. from this <laughs> old um, story of a bar joke where someone came to um, Ernest Hemingway and said, I bet you can't write a novel in six words. There's actually a website called Six Word Stories. Ah, okay. And, I mean, it's fabulous stuff. People are writing these six-word stories, and the, the, the way they related it there was somebody bet him he couldn't do it in six words. He says, of course I can. And it, Hemingway being famous for short, cryptic sentences. Yeah. And he wrote this just as you said. Mm -hmm. He wrote this six-word story, uh, baby shoes for sale, never worn. And it, that gives me a chill. I know. I, I don't I know. It's a beginning, yeah. middle, yeah. and an end. It is, yeah. Yeah. I know. And a lot to think about. And uh -huh. that, that little bar story has generated this website, and lots of people are doing lots of creative things with six word stories. It got me thinking about Basho, the great Japanese haiku poet who defined a new art form of 17 syllables for Japanese poetry. And I, I got to thinking, why couldn't we do something similar to this in photography? Particularly because it's amazing how many times people send work to lens work for us to consider for publication. And for six images or eight images or ten images, it's fabulous. It's just wonderful. But eventually it kind of becomes sometimes repetitive or they start putting in some filler or whatever. And we thought, gosh, if, if it was six, it'd be just perfect. Um, and so why not try to define that as a form? That reminded me of another strange little story that you may or may not have heard of. And that is the birth of the short story as a genre in fiction, which literally did not exist in literature until the magazine business right. became That's a right. thing in the late 19th century. And suddenly there was a medium for short stories and it took off like crazy. 
And I, I thought, well, maybe the same thing can happen with this. So we decided we would do a book publication. Uh, we called it a lens work community project. So that got me thinking about the short, the short stories. About, yeah, that got me thinking about short stories, and which was a, a genre of American literature that literally didn't exist until the magazine business was invented in the late 19th century, and suddenly there was a demand for short stories. And writers found it was fabulous, and there's a whole um, movement of short fiction now. F. Scott Fitzgerald made a there lot you, of money doing that. Yeah, and I, I mean, think, no, seriously. Yeah, yeah, he actually put aside novels for a while because he was making a lot of money doing yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And Sherlock Holmes. I mean, yeah. that was all written based on magazine publication in The Strand and all mm -hmm. that stuff. So I got to thinking, we could do the same thing in photography. We decided on six images, a little bit arbitrarily, quite honestly, but in a book publication, it makes three facing pages, so hence mm. six. So we searched around for a title, came up with Seeing in Sixes, announced this as a book publication project to the Lenswork readership and community and said, if you can put together six images that tie together as a theme, uh, have a stylistic similarity, uh, include text if you want that tells a story, poetry, could have any of that, but make a little six image thing. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea what we tapped into, but we were flooded mm -hmm. with people who caught on to this idea. We published the book last year and it was so much fun, we're doing it again this year. Let me ask then, what, where, what's the difference between that and a photo essay? Well, maybe not a lot. But for previous generations, a photo essay, like in, uh, the Life Magazine, Life Magazine, Look Magazine, they were, you know, part of the genre of photography. A lot of people did them. W. Eugene Smith, blah blah blah. Everybody knew what they were. But where do you see those now? Right. I mean, they sort of dried up and blew away. Yeah. The closest yeah. thing we have to it might be something like National Geographic, but that's way more than six images. Yeah. 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 And they're not really photography based, they're text based with photos to illustrate. illustrate right. We were trying to flip that around and do it the other way. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful idea. I think it's a lost art, quote unquote, but I think we're talking about editing here more than photography, maybe? I no? think so. Um, matter of fact, I think this is one of the biggest things that's come to photography in the last 10 years that, uh, a lot of people are catching on to it, but a lot of people still haven't, and that's this. Photography used to be uh, very much about the singular image, and not a lot of people, other than the photo essays, as you mentioned, were thinking about extended projects unless you set out to do a book. And a book was often a collection of my greatest hits, mm -hmm. so a monograph or something like that. But thinking in terms of editing, sequencing, uh, the interspersal of text, mm -hmm. titles, captions, that was always the purview of the editor. Right. The photographers were never the ones involved in that. In fact, they were told to go away. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But now, in this day and age in which we live, photographers are having to become their own editors, their own sequencers. And it's a skill that a lot of us haven't developed yet because we're too busy mastering the craft of photography and the individual image. Or saying to oneself, I'm not a writer, or I'm not a designer, I'm not a whatever, before you even give it a shot. Right, right. We had tremendous feedback from last year's Seeing in Sixes project of people saying that they had so much fun just because the structure gave them a way to think about their photography and something to do that they'd never thought about doing before. They were always thinking about the frame, you know, above the fireplace. Now they had a way to think differently about their work, and we had lots of folks. It just breathed new life into their art making. Yes, you know, the thing about having parameters, one of my teachers back in school, I, th I think it was Milton Glaser, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it was him. There was an assignment he gave out in the class, and somebody was griping about some of the limitations that had to be this, had to be, he had certain requirements. Mm -hmm. And he set the record straight real fast, and he said, your restrictions, your parameters, are your creative tools. Because once you know what you can't do, mm -hmm. everything else is possible. So if anything, take these parameters. Yes, it has to be eight by 10, and it has to be a vertical, and you have to have a red star in it somewhere. That's what you have to do. Now, exactly. now, now's your turn to be creative. Now, take it from there. 
Yeah, the quote that I used in my talk earlier uh, from Orson Welles was that the, the great enemy of art is the lack of limitations. Yeah. And so once we establish those guide rails and we can move within, you know, uh, wiggleable guide rails, if you will, uh, then the creativity loosens up, but we don't find ourselves down a rabbit hole somewhere because the guide rails help keep us on the straight and narrow path. I've often said that the real challenge of being an artist is not making the art, it's figuring out where you want to make the limits. And once you have mm. the limits defined, then making the art within those limits is something you can let yourself become creative within and it becomes a lot easier. If you don't have those limits, then you're in trouble. I yeah. mean, imagine this. Imagine you said, I want to produce a photography book of limitless number of pages. How, how do you begin doing the editing? How do you begin doing the organizing, the culling? But if you say, hey, I'm going to make you know, a 96-page book, that structure in itself is going to you know, get you thinking about which ones go in and which ones don't go in, and et cetera. And it's going to fuel the creative process and really intensify the experience when it's all said and done. And, and once you take away those parameters, it's just chaos. Can be. Can be. It chaos. can be yeah, and yeah. usually will yeah. be unless you're extremely disciplined and know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I find myself given an open book like that, just repeating myself and going over again, yeah. and pulling something out and putting it back in without, without a goal, without like, the ability to find that goal. And it becomes a problem. So I, I, you know, I, yeah. I agree with these ideas. Yeah. Well, lens work itself is all about projects. We, mm -hmm. we, we publish projects. We, we tend not to do my greatest hits kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's a related challenge in the sense that how do you define what the parameters of a project are? Do you, uh, if you're going to go to, well, How do you I know, know I, end? I, I can I illustrate know. it this way. I once did a portfolio review with a guy from China. And this was in China. I had a translator helping me. And he showed me a, a bunch of very colorful, abstract images. They were wonderful. And I said, what is the title of your project? And he said through the translator, the title of my project is America. <laughs> and I thought, the aristocrats. I thought, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he further explained that what had happened is he'd, he'd come to America, visited Yellowstone National Park, and photographed the mud pots. <laughs> that was his experience of America. Right. You know? And I said, oh. well, your photographs are great, but I think we need to come up with a title that narrows it down a little bit, <laughs> you know, because America is a big place. Well, it's the same kind of thing. You decide you want to do a photography project. How do you define what you're going to include and what you're not going to include? How are you going to decide what the edit parameters will be unless you sort of define what the project is? CE and sixes is just a sort of extreme example of that. Instead of editing down to 30 or 40 images like we generally like to have submitted to lens work, we generally publish about oh, 16 or 18 of a given portfolio. We're just making it even tighter, bringing it down to six, six images. And that squeezing sort of gives people an incentive to think more clearly, and that's one of the great challenges of art making. I like the way you phrased it earlier, or somebody had mentioned that it, it, was, it was fun. Maybe you don't burden yourself with this idea of, oh, I'm not getting all my greatest photos in there because it's such a small number. And that does give you a, a kind of a chance to enjoy the process a little bit as opposed to suffer through it. I don't know. Yeah, th there's another aspect of this that's always fascinated me too, and it's, it's what I call the problem of a pile of prints. As photographers for, forever, what we've produced is you know a, a pile of prints, either matted or not. And someone comes over to the house and says, gee, I'd like to see your work. You say, great. You pull out a pile of prints, and what do they do? They pick up a print, and they look at it, and they move it over here to the right. And then they pick up another print and move it to the right. And they go through your pile of prints looking at them. Well, I've been fascinated by that because I know in my heart that's not what's really happening. What's really happening is they're looking at each print individually and saying, I like this one, I don't like this one. This is a good one, this isn't a good one. In their mind, what they're doing is sort of moving some to the left and some to the right. And some to, but they <laughs> totally. wouldn't do that in front of you because it would be embarrassing. Right. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down judgment. Yeah. The question becomes, against what criteria. Mm -hmm. So the criteria might be, I like it, I don't like it. Well, that doesn't really say much about your artwork. It might be, 
this looks like what I think a good photograph ought to look like, not uh, or not what a good photograph ought to look like. This has this is improperly developed. It's got visible dodging and burning. It's you know photographically suspect or not. None of which, however, none of those judgments have anything to do with the artistic content of what you're trying to say. They have to do with technical stuff or whether the person likes it or doesn't like it. But somehow you put together a group of images, be it in a seeing in sixes kind of project or a portfolio, or in my case with my personal work, I do uh, handmade artist books, chat books, or little folios that have a, a group of 10, 15 images, suddenly that thumbs up, thumbs down aspect of any given image seems to disappear. They'll still thumbs up or thumbs down, but they'll do it on the project. And ba But in the meantime, what they will at least do is look at the images and say, what is the artist trying to say? What am I getting out of this? And that brings a whole different mindset to viewing artwork than the people who are just doing a quick thumbs up, thumbs down based on is this a good picture or not. I think that's a great, it's an incredible point. Uh, yeah. I really, I couldn't agree more. Uh, speaking of, uh, is that your chosen method now to, to display your work and, and to have it seen as a folio? Or is it just for my project own personal to project? Work? Yeah. yeah, for my own personal work, I, I basically do three things now. I do folios of work, which is individual unbound prints in a... Um, art paper enclosure mm -hmm. that's one thing uh, and, and have, is there a number that you tend to go number of mm, images the smallest ones I do have five images the largest one I think I've ever done has 18 and it gets starts to get a little thick and you know you have to worry about viewer fatigue and some of those issues the real problem with folios although I love it when I, when I first invented the idea of folios back in the late 80s early 90s I just fell in love with it because it's sort of partway between an original print and a yeah, book, and a book yeah. you know, so it sort of gives you the best of both worlds, and it's something you can do one at a time. The problem with it, however, is the sequence is not fixed. Uh, so once I send it out into the world, people can shuffle the images uh, in the folio, yes. so it has to be constructed in such a way that sequencing is not critical. Well, sometimes that doesn't work if you want to tell a story. Right. And so anything that involves text that has to be told in a certain sequence, images that have to be seen in a sequence, then I do a hand-bound, hand-sewn, uh, they're called chat books. They're basically an artist book. And now that there's inkjet printing, those are relatively easy to do because you can print on both sides of the sheet of paper and it makes handmade books or fan-fold books or those kinds of things. So those are the two printed media. And then for my own personal work, the more and more I find myself doing digital media. Uh, PDFs, I started this uh, essentially a personal magazine of my work, uh, which I call Kokoro, which is Japanese for essentially the heart of the matter, it's sort of the heart. I I'm the one guy in America who can't ever get his images printed in a magazine because <laughs> none of the other magazines are going to print my work, right? <laughs> and if I printed my own work right. in my own magazine, magazine, it'd be a little tacky. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, why not just do my own personal publication as a digital PDF, which I do uh, roughly on a monthly basis, and it'll have small projects, sometimes a little seeing in sixes things, sometimes longer projects, sometimes individual images. But uh, this is one of the great things about being a photographer today is anybody could do a digital publication and have all kinds of fun with it and with hardly any cost distributed it literally around the world and you distribute uh, free of charge oh yeah for these PDFs yeah, yeah my I, I'm fortunate in that I don't have to pay the rent with the money I might might make from my artwork of course you know in that regard I suppose uh, that flies in the face of a lot of photographers who really do want to make a career out of it. And they have a different set of challenges. But I've always felt if I was gonna enter uh, th the world of commerce with my photography, I would have to make images that fit into the world of commerce. That is to say, I'd be, I don't know, making kittens with yarn and dewy <laughs> spider webs and sunsets because that's what the market wants to buy. If you wanna do your own personal work, you better have some clear thinking about commerce. And in my case, I do work because I want to get it out into the world, not because I want to make money with it. So 
So, but that's that's just me. That's, that, I have a different perspective about that. So, you rob Seven Elevens and gas stations to uh, pay bills. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, for the vast majority of my life, I subsidized my art life with my day job. Mm-hmm. Which is? Uh, well, we ask? back then I had a consulting company or I worked in business. Now it's publishing lens work. I mean, that, okay. that's essentially my business is, is I'm a magazine publisher and a book publisher and et cetera. And a great, and, ma- great magazine, if we can just throw that yes. in. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thanks. One of the greatest out there. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I, I don't. I don't want to put the burden of having to pay the rent on my creative artwork because then I would have to make compromises in my artwork that I it's, might not be yeah. comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, so for me, free makes sense, not for prints. I mean, for, for things that cost money, I charge money because I have to subsidize them with, sure. uh, you know, ink and paper is not free, mm-hmm. et cetera. But with PDFs, what the heck? Well, now that we're on the subject, can you... Are you now printing with inkjet, all inkjet, or yeah, yeah. how was that transition for you? And uh, you, you know, I have to be honest. For me, it was incredibly easy, for the simple reason that I was never much of a fan of the darkroom. I, I, I was pretty good at it, but I, I didn't really like it. To me, it was fighting a lot of chemistry in order to get something to look like what I wanted to look like. And if you really think about it. In the wet darkroom, you spend about 98% of your time fussing with chemistry and trays and, you know, prints and, and et cetera. Water temperature. Water temperature, all that stuff, in order to then flip the lights on and spend about two minutes looking at the picture to then make changes in it so that it can <laughs> it get again. closer <laughs> to the aesthetic thing. And so it was 2% aesthetic decision, 98% materials mani- manipulation. And that, to me, never, I mean, it wasn't my great joy in life. So when digital photography came along, and I could now spend 98% of my time working on aesthetics and 2% of my time working on tone curve adjustments or whatever the case may be, to me, it was the perfect answer. So I made the transition easily. I have to be honest, also... I had used the same camera for 38 years, and it was an Arca-Swiss monorail, two and a quarter, three and a quarter view camera. So I was used to seeing the world on a screen this big. When I got an LCD back on my camera, it was about this big. <laughs> so Except it was, it was easier to see and it wasn't upside down and backwards. Exactly. Yes. So to me, the transition <laughs> was as smooth as could be. And I, I shut down the darkroom and never looked back. I've actually, when, when I'm walking down the street, I see somebody holding up a, a tablet or, or an iPad. And I'm saying, it looks like the back of a 4x5 or an 8x10 camera. Because I also, I learned photography on a 4x5 camera. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, look at that. That's exactly what we were doing, except it, you don't need a dark cloth, and it's a hell of a lot easier to see what you're doing. Well, the other thing that I found is that as life got more complicated with kids and business and, you know, obligations, families, et cetera, et cetera, my ability to go in the dark room and spend, you know, 72 hours on a long weekend buried in the dark room until 2 o'clock in the morning. You have your nerves spending morning. the weekend in your dark room. That's yeah. right. Yo, you have your nerves. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. but with, with something like Photoshop or now with Lightroom, where you can, sit, or Lightroom Mobile, I might add, I can take advantage of 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and push the ball down the field a little bit on the creative process, even if it's just working with collections or some rough outs in terms of processing, and then sit down with Lightroom without having to, you know, do a lot of chemistry mixing and temperature adjusting and all that kind of stuff. I can be productive like that. So for me, it was it was great and easy transition. I remember I there. once took an Epson printer, b- dragged it out to my patio, all right, and I, and I, I did it specifically so I can call a friend of mine to say, I am doing museum quality color prints right now while barbecuing burgers and fry and french fries in my backyard under midday sun. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. You know, there's a really interesting question that comes about. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but to me it's just a fascinating idea. In the wet darkroom days, when Ansel Adams or someone went in there and they made the print, there was no question what the original was. The original mm. was the print. Mm-hmm that he had done. But now that we literally are in the age of command P, you know, and, and it'll come out, 
where does the original print sit or where does the original right. sit? Yeah. So in a number of issues ago, I, I wrote in Lenswork that I've concluded that the original is now the digital file. That's the one where we make all the aesthetic decisions, that we decide what it's going to look like. The same way Ansel or Wynn Bullock or whoever used to go in the darkroom and make all those aesthetic decisions in their dodging and burning and cropping and processing and all that kind of stuff, that where the aesthetic decisions are made is what determines the original. Now, isn't that a mind warp? To think that your, your TIFF file or your Photoshop file is your original and the prints that come out of your Epson yeah. are the copies. That's how a very does, interesting thought. How does that change commerce? How does that change additioning? Does additioning even make sense anymore? I mean, so many things are now needing to be rethought as a result of all of this incredible technology that who, who could have anticipated this? Can you imagine selling limited I mean, edition screenshots? That would be a coup. <laughs> well, if we could figure out a way of doing that, that'd be great. Just the, the code behind <laughs> what you're selling. And that's, that, what are you selling? Well, you're selling code. I mean, you know, I mean, well, you know, when, when Edward Weston wanted to sell photographs, he had a hell of a time doing it because there wasn't a market, market for it. photography. It sure. just didn't exist. It hadn't been invented Lee yet. Lee Friedlander used to go around hawking his books with his wife in the back of the car. I know. I know. <laughs> Aren't we sort of in that same place? We're, you know, you're joking about what do you sell or how do you sell a screensaver or a digital print? It's no different than the challenge Edward Weston had. Mm -hmm. He his challenge was how do you sell a gel and silver print when no one thought it was worth anything? Absolutely. Yeah. No one thinks a digital image is worth anything. But then you know, I don't know what's going to be coming down the road. Uh, it, it could be very, very interesting. But these are the kind of questions that it may take another generation. See, the difference answer. is that the, the digital file, if you hit the switch, it goes away. Whereas the print, it's in your hand. It's tactile. It's physical. It can be destroyed. But I think there's always going to be a difference between the two. Okay. Now you've opened up a real interesting can of worms. Um, That's why they pay me the big bucks. I, okay. Yeah. I got it. No. <laughs> Uh, I've heard this argument for years that prints are permanent and... and, and Not permanent, and, tangible. Uh, tan tangible. Okay, and permanent. Okay, and, go and ahead. Permanent. I'm sorry, go ahead. But my contention is I'm not sure I buy that argument for one simple reason, and I can illustrate it best with two words, Billy Holiday. Now, Billy Holiday's original work came out on wax cylinders or 78 discs, etc., they were, they were physical. But, you know, if you and I want to listen to Billie Holiday today, we can. Even though we don't have a 78 player, we can still hear her wonderful music. And as a matter of fact, think of the iterations that it's gone through, mm -hmm. from 78s to 45s to LPs to 8-track tapes to cassettes to CDs. And now it's, you know, MP3 files are streaming over the web. The quality stuff always will be translated to the new medium. And I think the same thing will happen with photography. My prints may not last, but really that's a testament to the fact that they weren't good enough to last. The good stuff will. And if, if I make a PDF today, and it's really a terrific PDF, I have no doubt that it'll still be available 100 years from now. It may not be a PDF, but somebody will figure out a way to write some conversion software that makes my PDF whatever the next thing is that I can't even predict down. Could Billie Holiday predict MP3s and, <laughs> and Pandora? Yeah. Hell no. Well, let me just throw this in to make it even more complicated. When I think of Billie Holiday or when I want to hear, I can just listen, you know, it's there. I mean, without any medium, without anything. I mean, you, you, you can hear, hear the songs long head. enough and you hear, you know, some of the greatest things are right there, you know, if you can pull them back. Well, because Billie Holiday's artwork made a connection mm -hmm. with you. Sure. And so you, it lives in your brain. Right. And by the way, you weren't around when Billie Holiday was singing. So it, it, it has made it into the future. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, two thoughts about that. One, the purpose of art is to connect. That's what it's all about, is making connections with another human being. And so if we make those connections via PDFs or prints, it's the connection that to me is more important, not the medium of the connection, number one. Number two is this, that 
you talk to any archivist in the world and they will tell you that the most important thing you can introduce in an archive scenario to ensure longevity is multiple copies. If you have one copy of something and it's unique, its chance of surviving into the long-term future diminishes radically. But if you have 20 copies, you know, the chances that one of them are going to survive has gone up dramatically, right? So think about digital media where we can make literally an infinite number of copies via downloads and whatnot. I mean, they're, they're and they everywhere. And they do not degenerate. They do. And they don't degrade with every copy and et cetera. So in my way of thinking, the, the print, which is unique, has probably got the least chance of surviving. Where the digital publication, like a PDF or whatever, if it's a high enough quality, like Billy Holiday's artwork, it probably has a much greater chance because you're going to have multiple copies. They'll be able to be converted to whatever tomorrow's format is uh, pretty easily without degradation. Mm -hmm. The chances of them surviving into the future go up dramatically. So I, I'm not I'm not in the least bit intimidated about not wanting to do PDFs. Uh, the one thing I'd like to get your thoughts on, um, of course, you know, uh, the digital medium has, has made everything more accessible. And like you said, good artwork will continue on. Mm -hmm. um, it, it probably easier now than it would have back in the, in the physical days. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think that it's um, that the, the fact that it's so accessible has devalued um the art in, so, in some sense, because, you know, I, there's so much less control over the intellectual property. Yeah, intellectual property is a whole separate issue that I think, um, I'm not a lawyer and it scares me. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know how that's going to play out. But but you're no, there's no question you're right about something that is going to change with how we value and... Um, how we insure and how we collect and sell and all that, that all of that's going to change, which I think is for the better. And quite honestly, <laughs> I get in a lot of trouble with this idea, but I blame Stieglitz. I think he absolutely messed it up horribly. <laughs> Stieglitz wanted to make photography respectable. He was the first guy who really said this needs to be an art. And I think what Stieglitz sort of did is he cast about and looked at the art world and said, what is photography like? And he said, well, it's kind of like painting. So we can put it in a frame and we can put it on a wall and it goes into the gallery scenario and it can be collectible and et cetera. And Stieglitz put us on a path with photography, which we have never recovered from. So now there's, you know, the $4 million print and the collectible gallery and all of that kind of stuff. What if Stieglitz had cast about and said, what is photography like? What if he had said, it's kind of like music. It's infinitely reproducible. Uh, it, it is a truly democratic art form. It ought to be available to everybody for a very little amount of money. What if he had said it's more like Japanese ukiyo-e prints, woodblock prints, hokusai and all that, that sell for fractions of a penny, rather than wall art that gets collected in a frame in a you know uh, up, upper end New York gallery? Photography would be totally different today. The question is, would it be healthier? And I can't help but conclude that it probably would be for the simple reason that I can ask the question, how many photographers are there in the world right now who make a living with their photographic artwork? You know, there aren't very many. They almost all have a day job. I mean, Michael Kenna does commercial work. and Even Ansel Adams did school portraits, for God's sake, right? <laughs> you know, so uh, how many photographers make a living with artwork? Not very many. But if photography was something that was being purchased by everybody in the culture, the way music is purchased by everybody in the culture. Don't you think there would be a lot more photographers who were making a living with their artwork? Personally, I would love to be able to download an original Ansel Adams for 99 cents on iTunes. 
Well, or at least <laughs> something that you could put in one of these digital frames that yes. looks fabulous on the wall. And there are some good ones out here, if you I noticed. I know. I, yeah, I, uh -huh. yeah, they're fantastic. I, I don't know where that's going to lead, but I got to think it's going to lead. Some well, what's the cost of framing today? My goodness, the framing costs 10 times what the cost of the, the print photo costs. That's where the money is. Yeah. It, it, if it you is. want to live, frame the pictures, that's where your money is. So, again, that leads us back to some of the way the media is changing, some of the way we photographers need to change the way we think about what we're doing, what we're producing, what we value, how society is going to consume it and pay for it, and etc. Even the book, which, you know, I'm a book fan. I'm a publisher, of course. I love books. I love ink. But if you look at what's happened in the book business in the last 10 years, you know, which I can, I suppose, sum up in one word, borders, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're gone. The yeah. book publication is in terrible shape right now. Yeah. So what's going to replace it? Maybe digital? I don't know. I'm not a pro prognosticator, but it certainly seems to be a candidate. By the way, interesting, on that same topic, a new magazine was launched on Friday. I don't know if you caught it. It's called Kodachrome, and it's... <laughs> put out by Kodak, and it's all things photographic and not just limited to digital, the art and craft and love of photography. The first issue is yeah. out. It's going to be put out regularly. Isn't that interesting? I subscribe. It's 20 bucks for the first copy, limited run. I just want to see what it's like, and based on what I saw it's in it, it's, it's, to me, that's exciting that Kodak is kick-starting something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, is, that is very exciting. I hope yeah. they do well. So I mean, do I. That's one of the things about the... The days that we live in now is we can do almost, almost every process that's ever been invented in photography, we can do it today. Yes. You know, Kodachrome might be one of the few exceptions, but the point is if you want to make tintypes, make tintypes. If you want to make digital prints, make digital prints. There is so much creative freedom now. It's a fabulous time to be a photographer. It's just great. Boom. It's great. Perfect, All right. perfect place to end. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate being here. Brooks Jensen, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Pleasure Let, talking with you, sir. Let's throw out the, uh, the websites and everything where we can find your work and, and lens work and things like that. Can you give sure. it to us? Sure. Okay. It's uh, www.lenswork.com, lenswork.com, and my own personal work is at brooksjensenarts.com. Thanks much. Yeah. Thanks. Wonderful. Great. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you, sir. Okay, a big thank you to Brooks Jensen. And we're going to be right back with the next episode of Dispatch with Adrian O'Hanison. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. In this segment of Dispatch, Adrian Hannison talks about the cameras, lenses, and gear she uses in covering news in Africa. She compares her newest Sony mirrorless cameras to her Canon tanks and offers insight on working in some of the toughest conditions imaginable. Adrian also continues to detail her assignment work, and here she is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with rangers combating illegal poaching and mining in Okapi Wildlife Reserve. She tells of the region and its struggle for resources and of the dangers, both natural and human, that confront locals and visitors alike. Chronicling her time with the rangers and her miles-long hike through thick jungle, she shares thoughts on developing photo narrative with understated humor and prepares us for the next chapter to this story, which ultimately turns quite tragic. Here's Adrian. Before I go into a bit about the Congo trip, I wanted to kind of go over how I prepare for these trips um, in terms of what I bring, what I don't bring, having enough to keep yourself comfortable and healthy, but then also not burdening yourself um, with too much gear um, and being overweight for small flights or um, just exhausting yourself um, by carrying so much. So a lot of these trips that I take are quite physically demanding. Um, I'm often keeping up with military or in this case, keeping up with park rangers who are used to hiking miles and miles each day. And I think on this trip, we ran about 17 kilometers um, through mud and thick jungle. So it's really important to me at least to have some solid things with me. Um, and at this point in time, it's kind of like clockwork. I can put everything together very quickly. I really stick to the basics. A lot of them are just essentials in terms of living. So the bags that I use are 
water pur purification tablets and things like that. But then I also want to talk about um, some of the gear that I've been using in terms of cameras um, because I've been in a bit of a crisis <laughs> with my cameras uh, for the last year or so, I guess. Um, I'd always shot with Canons. I always had a 50 and a 35 and the 24-105 with me. Um, mostly I just shoot with a 35. That's, that's my lens. Um, so I basically started out with a 5D Mark II and then, um, that died, um, in South Sudan. And then after that, um, I was given a Canon, uh, 1DS Mark III and that was from a friend and I used that for a really long time. And I love that camera. I really do. And it, it's funny, I'm not one of those people that's really into gear, but I'm so picky about what I use. So if something works well for me um, in the field, then, then I get really attached to it. Um, and it's really important to me. So I'm a gear person, but not a gear person. So I was shooting with a, yeah, the 1DS Mark III for a long time um, and ended up having two of those camera bodies. Love them. They're like tanks. Um, reliable. I never shot over 800 ISO with them, which is kind of funny. Um, that's the camera that I did uh, my DAR4 work with uh, and just loved it, still love it. But it's funny, I had two, and the one I really loved working with, the focus was broken. It would only focus in the middle, which is how I tend to use the cameras anyway. I always focus with the center focus and then move my frame. And so it's funny, when my favorite 1DS died, I started using the other one and it just wasn't the same. It was, a, I don't know, maybe it had a different spirit to it. Um, so I also started searching for a second camera. So in my search, I got really interested in the Sonys um, purely because they're small, um, they're lightweight, um, working with the 1DS, it, I mean, it's huge. It's larger than my face. It, it takes two hands to hold. Um, the shutter sounds like an earthquake. I love it, but it's a loud, clunky camera, and you're not going to pull that out anywhere without anyone noticing that you have a massive camera with you. So I ended up first with, I guess it was the AS2 that I started with and liked working with it, liked it as a second camera, but... It wasn't quite as quick as I was used to with the, with the Canons. Um, and I found it really hard to go back and forth between my Canon and the Sony, especially when the, so the, you can see the exposure inside of the, of the frame of the Sonys. So it was hard to be working on exposure with the Canon and then going to the Sony where you could see the exposure in the camera. And I go back to the Canon and I couldn't see the exposure through the frame. So that confused me a bit, and I always shoot um, manual. So that was getting a bit tricky for me um, to go back and forth. So then I actually ended up picking up a um, uh, AR2, uh, which became my main camera. And again, I was just working with Sony lenses with these two cameras. So I had a 55 and a 35, and mainly started shooting with the R2 and, and liked it, but I was having a lot of difficulty with the heat and the dust because a lot of the places that I work, you know, it's boiling hot and the dust is horrific. And I was changing lenses a lot, which probably wasn't great for the dust or definitely wasn't great for the dust. Um, so most of the time I just stuck with my, with my 35. The other issue I had was the uh, overheating. So, I mean, I've worked... The places I work are extremely hot. We're talking about 100 degrees or above most days of the year. And it's funny, most, some photographers like to like put tape over the branding on the cameras. They say it's distracting or they don't want the Canon sign or the Sony sign or like to customize their cameras. And I have had tape on my camera before and it would just melt off. Even the, I'd have the screen protectors and I've had those melt off. So I'm not working in great conditions, and I know it takes a really tough camera just to withstand that sort of heat. And that was something that was really bothering me about the Sony is, is uh, they were just overheating on a regular basis. Um, but we'll see. I just upgraded them, so 
hopefully with the new software, it's going to um, solve that problem. Uh, it was more of an issue with video, but it also happened to me um, with photos. And, and when it did happen, it seemed like it took it, it took a really long time for the camera to cool. So I'd give it a few minute break and then try it again. Um, so it just seemed not as, uh, not as reliable as my tanks of Canon cameras. Uh, and I'm still, I'm still carrying around this, um, 1DS body, which is somehow hilarious. I've brought it on a number of trips now, along with my two Sony's just with the 35 lens with my Canon 35 lens, but I can't let go of this camera. I just feel like if something happens with the Sony's or I don't know, I just want to have this tank with me. I know it's indestructible, so I just have to have that in my bag. And it's definitely weighting down my kit because if I can just travel with these two camera bodies, light to Sony camera bodies, then, uh, you know, it's silly to carry around this massive camera, but, uh, I'm still attached to it. Uh, and another thing about the Canons is just the battery life. So I end up burning through so many batteries with my Sony's, uh, which isn't a big deal. I mean, I don't mind carrying around extra batteries because honestly, even if I bring five, 10 extra Sony batteries with me, they're still so light. So I don't mind that so much. Um, but again, some of the places I work, there's not a lot of power. So that becomes a huge issue. So that's another reason I, I continue to drag my Canon body with me is if I know I'm going to be out um, in the field for an extended period of time, I bring that camera and the batteries with me just in case, like, what if I, I don't know, what if the days are cloudy or I can't get enough charge to my solar panel, then, you know, I just want to have these batteries with me for my Canon that I know um, can last me a few days on, on one battery sometimes, which is awesome. I've been super attached for a really long time to National Geographic bags, and I don't know too many other people that use them. I really like them, and it's, <laughs> it's just a coincidence, but the ones that I enjoy using, I think it, they're called like the Africa edition. And that's just a complete coincidence. I can honestly say I wasn't Googling Africa bag when I decided to start using these, these camera bags. And I even started using them before I moved to Africa. So there's no relation there. It's just a coincidence. Um, but I really like them. They're tough. They're really tough. Um, the straps where they attach to the bag is tough. The zippers are tough. The fabric is tough. Um, I've had them for years. I've bought a few different ones, but, um, I just love them and they're padded and they seem to be somewhat waterproof. Um, and the great thing for me about these bags is that they zip closed around the top and a lot of camera bags don't. And it, it's kind of shocked me because it's a combination of keeping dust out. So again, I'm working in crazy sandy conditions or, and to have a camera bag where it doesn't fully close just lets in so much more dust. So that's really essential for me, but also being in crowds or having my camera bag on my back uh, and not being, not having my eyes on it all the time and worrying that people can reach in the bag and take things out of the bag, uh, especially in crowds. Um, it's a shoulder bag, so, you know, I can have it in front of me, but I prefer it to be on my back. Uh, so it's not bothering me too much, but, um, so that's been one of the reasons I've stuck to the bag, that, and it's just, it's just tough. <laughs> and um, that's one of the things I really look for in any gear is that it can be dragged through sandstorms and jungles and, I don't know, through caves and, and whatnot. So that's really important to me. So I've loved those bags. A couple other things that I really can't live without. One has been my North Face bag. I just have like a black one. Um, but I can say this bag is actually quite waterproof because I'm a bit obsessive about putting all my things in my bag before I, I leave, um, my tent or wherever I'm staying for the day, just in case I need to grab it quickly to leave. And also just for bugs, I've had a lot of not great buggy experiences where I leave clothes out or shoes or 
sleeping bag, anything, and you're, I don't know, getting dressed or getting into your sleeping bag and there's a big bug in it. So I tend to just throw everything into my, my North Face duffel and leave it. So I did that and uh, I left it on the floor of my tent and it had rained. And not just little rain, like African downpour, five feet of rain in 20 minutes sort of rain. And the whole bottom of my tent had flooded. And my bag, everything inside was dry. It was amazing. I was the only one for quite a distance around the camp that had anything dry. So that bag has stuck with me for a very long time. Another good one has been my camelback. I found it in like a tactical section of camelback or an army supply version of camelback. It's called the ambush, I believe. And it carries three liters of water. And it also has some pockets. So it's like a small backpack with three liters of water. And this has probably literally been a lifesaver. Um, it's a bit heavy to carry the water around, but it's just been great to have there. And if it's accessible, I'll be drinking more. And I also like, it seems ridiculous, but I like to know how much water I've been consuming throughout the day. If I'm running around shooting a lot and it's really hot, um, one of the like key things, honestly, just to remain really aware and healthy is just to stay hydrated. Um, and so I can actually keep track of how much water I drink because I know if at the beginning of the day I have three liters in there and at the end of the day that's not almost gone, then I'm in trouble. Uh, so I try to go through at least one of those a day. I don't mind sharing my water supply, but when you have water bottles, they end up getting handed around and you just, you can't keep track of how much water you're drinking and people often ask for the water bottles. If you're using plastic water bottles in a lot of rural areas, that's a prized possession. People use them and refill them with honey or refill them with fuel. So um, they're really a desirable um, item. So it's hard, it's hard to refuse um, people when they ask for your empty water bottles. So normally I just bring like a one liter Nalgene and I'll purify that water um, because a lot of the water purification is done by, um, by liter. So I'll uh, purify that water, dump it into the bag um, and, and move from there. And that's been, that's been great. I love my Camelback. Um, and I, yeah, I throw that on with my camera bag over the top. And then I'll, I have like a, a belt as well. That's pretty much my go-to uniform. I look a bit like a Ninja Turtle, but, um, but yeah, it's worked well and everything's really strapped on me tightly. So if I'm running, um, if I'm climbing around, it's nice that my gear moves with me. I don't have gear swinging around much. Uh, and I normally just keep one camera body on me um, with a couple of lenses. And that's, that's pretty much it. So for this particular trip, we worked in Okapi, which is a reserve in eastern Congo. But we chose this area um, because we wanted to tell kind of about the cycle of conflict in this area. So the conflict between the, the reserve and conservation of animals of the, of the forest. But we also were interested in the gold mining that was happening and a bit of the, and a bit of the poaching. So this is kind of an area where all of those things come, come together. For this trip, and we're planning a few different trips, um, wanted to focus on what the park rangers were doing uh, within the reserve and what their relationship is with miners in the area, um, with people who are trying to extract um, gold or diamonds, um, people who are trying to take timber out, and also how they kind of work uh, against poaching in the area. So the plan was to go in, spend some time at the ranger's base in a place called Ipulu, and spend time with the rangers there, kind of see what their activities were, and then go out for a few nights to see, you know, really just see the lives of the rangers. And the reason it's important to see the lives of the rangers, not just what they're doing in the field, not just what they're doing on their patrols or what they're doing in their outposts, but also to see their lives, um, kind of their personal lives. So it's a very uh, dangerous job and rangers are killed every year. Um, 
trying to conserve these areas. Um, and a lot of them also um, are involved in other activities in these areas. So um, maybe some of them are involved directly in the gold mining, the poaching. Um, it's good to get a perspective in terms of what these people's lives look like. So I think that's, that's something that's quite important and from any perspective. If we're going to take the perspective of the rangers or if we're going to take the perspective of illegal miners or poachers, why are they doing these activities? Um, why have they been pushed to such violence um, in these areas? And I think for the most part, the answer every time will, will be that these communities um, are really quite desperate. One of the rangers said something quite interesting to me because it put all of this in perspective in terms of what wealth means. So this area is extremely wealthy. The earth is wealthy in human eyes. It's full of diamonds. It's full of gold. And it, what this ranger said to me was, some people make so much money off of, off of the gold and diamond mining. Some people make so much money that they can buy a car and buy a house. And that struck me because that just puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? People here aren't mining gold, pulling diamonds out of the ground. And we're talking about people at the bottom. We're talking about the people who are literally taking these things for the first time out of the earth. People who are literally digging with a shovel, um, if that, maybe their hands, to extract gold and diamonds. And these are the people who are really just trying, to, maybe, if they're the most successful, to afford a car and maybe a house. And a lot of conflict revolves around the, the territory where the gold and the diamonds are mined. People aren't fighting over what we would think to be ridiculous sums of money. It's not like people who are extracting these things are going and buying private jets and their third car. These people are really just trying to feed their families, maybe start, start up a small business, maybe buy some motorbikes. People are just trying to afford what we consider to be basics. And in this area of the world, those things are considered a huge privilege. So actually, right when we arrived um, at the ranger's base in Ipulu, so this is the base where Many of the rangers live who travel out into the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, patrol the land, um, you know, try to monitor poaching, try to monitor illegal mining that's, that's inside of the reserve. And this isn't actually a, a national park, so it, there are people who live inside of the reserve. So it's this really delicate balance between letting people who live there kind of maintain a certain level of normalcy, be able to farm, but without really destroying some of the spectacular jungle that surrounds the area. So right when we got to this ranger's base, they had just arrested three men the day before, I believe. And initially they're, they're taken to the base and the rangers listen to their stories um, and kind of decide from there if they're going to be taken to trial. They were saying, you know, if people are caught for the first or second time um, mining or poaching in the area, they usually let them go. So these three guys that were caught had been caught with diamonds, um, had been caught with eight diamonds and were hanging out in the small jail cells at the ranger headquarters. So this was a pretty interesting initial experience and, and first day of filming, actually, uh, where we got to sit in and listen to the stories of, of these guys who had been arrested, found with diamonds. We got to see the diamonds, um, which I was a bit nervous, nervous about filming, I guess. I, they're just <laughs> kept in the offices. And I was like, isn't that dangerous, you know, to keep these around? They're quite valuable. And everyone was just telling me, oh, no, no, we, we do this all the time. We take diamonds off people all the time, um, wear those diamonds end up at the end of the day, I'm not quite sure. It was, it was good to get that initial perspective of these guys who are being jailed, who I'm sure um, are the breadwinners for their families, uh, losing out on these 
little gemstones that they had spent a couple of weeks trying to extract from the ground. Uh, so that was our, our initial day of shooting. Yeah, so we got to go around the rangers' camp a bit and, um, and then discuss what we wanted to do with the rangers. And what we decided was that we would trek um, to an outpost, so to one, one of the rangers' camps that was just next to a, a gold mine that the rangers had shut down. And so they had done this a couple of months earlier. It seemed that they had given the miners a bit of a heads up before they just came in and were like, all right, everybody out. Um, you can't mine in this area anymore. This area is um, part of the reserve. So they had gone the day before, told people they had to evacuate the area. Um, so since then, there had been a ranger outpost um, where they were just kind of monitoring this gold mine and making sure people weren't moving back in. Um, so the plan was to go um, and stay two or three nights in the jungle with uh, these rangers. And it was, it was good for us. It was good for our story because we wanted the visuals of, of a gold mine. Um, and it also gave the rangers a chance to show kind of a success story. So you can see the devastation of the forest um, and you can see some of the gold mining areas where people had dug up the ground or um, had built trenches so that they could wash the gold. So kind of created little man-made rivers um, to be able to, to separate the gold. That was the idea to track about, yeah, I think it was around 15, 17 kilometers or so through the jungle um, and spend time with the, with the park rangers there. So there was one group that was at the outpost already. And then there was another group coming in to relieve uh, those rangers. So a new one would come in and the group that had been there for about two weeks would come out. So we hiked in, carried all of our own food for a few days. Um, going through the jungle, it's rainy season in Congo, so super muddy. And you're ducking through jungle and getting hit in the face with branches. And, and it's fun. It's cool. Um, I'd never been in such dense forests before. Um, you can hardly see the sky. Um, and even when it rained, you hardly even got wet because the foliage was so thick. So we hiked for a ways, and then we ended up having to cross the river in these tiny, tiny dugout canoes um, that are literally just a small tree with a, yeah, a dugout part in the middle. And they're super rocky. I grew up in canoes and, and kayaks. Um, and yeah, this thing... <laughs> I was a bit nervous, um, but the rangers were even more nervous because a lot of them didn't know how to swim. Um, and I was filming a, a ranger, a female ranger actually, uh, as we crossed the river. And so I had a camera on her. And partway across the river, I was like, oh, this isn't just gonna be horrible footage because this poor woman is terrified. I didn't even look around. I just kept staring through the camera trying to focus on something else. So we all got to the other side. It took about an hour because we had to ferry um, two people by two people. Yeah, I finally made it up to the camp where the, the rangers um, were posted. It was on a small hill uh, overlooking this abandoned gold mine. It was a pretty spectacular sight. Um, and a huge tree had fallen um, or had been fallen by uh, the gold miners. And so you walked up the base of this long tree to get to the top of the hill. It was quite magical, actually. These guys really risk their lives um, out in the jungle, and it's dangerous work. And we're there cooking dinner, so we decided to make a fancy dinner the first night. Um, we didn't do any real shooting because we were busy trekking. I was taking some photos and, and doing some video along the way, but. Uh, we had planned to sit down with some rangers that evening, get to know people, um, see who maybe would be a good character, see if any of the rangers who were with us now um, had been there when the gold mine had been shut down. Um, so we found a, a couple of characters to um, talk with about that. Uh, found one ranger whose father had been a ranger and they had um, ridden down um, to Apulu where he now lived on an elephant back in the day. So um, there's quite a wide range of 
of people there. Yeah, so we decided to cook spaghetti with um, some tuna, and we had brought canned tuna. And one of the rangers um, was watching us cook the spaghetti and adding in the can of tuna and was just shaking his head and, and telling us uh, how dangerous it was to eat canned food because that could kill us. We should never, we should never consume canned food. Um, and I just thought that was, <laughs> I thought that was amusing. Um, he's totally right. Canned tuna is probably one of the worst things you can eat for many reasons. Um, but in terms of, of the dangers that surrounded us and the risks that, that some of these guys took on a regular basis and, and the police in the world where they lived being armed rangers in the middle of basically a conflict zone and, you know, being very worried about eating canned tuna just seemed quite funny to me. Okay, that concludes what we call another fine show. Be sure to stay with us for the next episode of Dispatch when Adrian concludes her story of this ultimately very dangerous assignment in the Congo jungle. Our thanks go to Adrian and to Brooks Jensen. And be sure to tune in next week when we'll replay our episode on photographing the 2017 solar eclipse just in time for that momentous event on August 21st. And then join us back the following week for all new episodes. For Jason and John and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today.